Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another event with the Oxford Karl Popper Society. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Sarah Fitzclaridge, who is a writer, coach, and speaker with a fallibilist worldview. She started the journal that became Taking Children Seriously in the early 1990s, after being surprised by the heated audience reactions she was getting when talking about children. She's spoken all over the world about taking children, taking children seriously. And to the, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first Zoom talk that she has given on the subject. Her talk <laughs> last approximately, that, that is right, isn't it? No. <laughs> oh, no? Oh, oh, really? I'm oh, sorry. Her talk will last approximately 45 minutes, after which there will be um, an audience question period and we'll have a discussion. Um, and just before I um, let her start, there are just there are two more bulletins. Um, one is that we are intending to sell bundles of uh, taking children seriously, the paper journal. Um, they haven't gone up gone up on the website yet, but um, they will do soon. And you can contact the Oxford Karl Popper Society if you're interested in buying them. Um, and one other bulletin is that we will be having a discussion on Clubhouse after this talk ends at approximately seven o'clock um, UK time. So I hope to see many of you there. And without further ado, I will give the floor to Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Taking children seriously is the only educational philosophy in existence that takes seriously the fact that human beings are both creative and also fallible. It's informed by Karl Popper's epistemology, of course. Instead of viewing some sources of ideas like parents as having authority, taking children seriously takes the growth of knowledge seriously, which means free competition of the ideas, irrespective of source. As many of you know, the most distinctive feature of taking children seriously is the idea that children should have the same freedom, respect, and control over their lives as adults. Now, I don't mean children should fend for themselves, by the way. Obviously, they very much need our love and protection, our care and attention, lots of engagement with their ideas. They're not born able to survive and thrive without us. Why is it that when I say that children should be in control of their lives, people hear children should be left to rot? If you are being guided up a mountain by an expert mountaineer, and say you're a novice, and I said, you should be in control of your own life, would that mean that the expert mountaineer should just leave you to rot halfway up the mountain? Of course not. We view children differently from how we view adults. There's this huge anomaly between the enlightenment ideas in our culture, on the one hand, how we think it's right to treat adults, how we view adults, and what we think right for children. So my aim here is to highlight this difference in view, because once you see it, as I've discovered myself, in fact, recently, and this is why I'm particularly excited about this talk, you see blind spots in your thinking that you had no idea were there. And I'm, I'm going to start where most people are in their view of children, but don't worry, we will get to more subtle issues later. So in the standard view of children, the way we see it is we're the adults, they're the children, they need to stop misbehaving and comply with our requests or face the consequences. And we genuinely feel that this is for their own good. Why do we call it misbehaving when it's a child, but disagreeing or a conflict when it's an adult? 
for that matter, why do we call it having a tantrum when a child is distressed? But when it's an adult, we say we're struggling or we're very frustrated or at the end of our tether. Why do we still think in terms of correction and discipline when it comes to children? But if you were to read a book advising people about how to use correction and discipline to coerce their spouses, you would be aghast. And if you were to follow that advice, you might find yourself being prosecuted for coercive control too, because the law recognizes, at least in England, don't know about other places, that it's not just domestic violence that's a problem, it's also non-violent coercive control. It recognizes that in the case of adults, but the standards are applied differently in the case of children. Why is that okay? I mean, if a grown woman can't tolerate being coercively controlled, how on earth can a defenseless child? Why is it okay for us to consider ourselves authorities over our children? We expect our children to ask permission and we're the authority over them, deciding whether to grant permission, letting them do something or to deny it, saying no to them. Yet we'd never presume to impose such an authoritarian relationship on our friends or our spouse. We take our friends and spouses seriously. At least we do now. Obviously there was a time when women weren't taken seriously. And it's not that they were seen as not human they were seen as a different kind of human. People who, for their own good, need to be living under the benevolent patriarchal authority of their father or their husband. Women weren't allowed to vote in those days and women weren't allowed to own property. And it was seen as improper for married women to work. And in fact, even in 1933, my own grandmother lost her job when she told her boss that she was going to get married. It was thought perfectly proper to discriminate based on sex or the marital status of women. And of course, similarly in America in the past, slavery was legal. But even after it became illegal, long after it became illegal, many still viewed black people differently from how they viewed white people. But whereas now most people take adults seriously as sovereign individuals, irrespective of sex or race or marital status, almost no one takes children seriously. In our culture, we've dropped the paternalism with respect to women and black people, but we have yet to drop the paternalism when it comes to children. Now, if you're objecting to my use of the word paternalism, given that it refers to the idea that certain people or groups should be controlled in a fatherly way for their own good, how is it any less immoral to control children than it was to control women. Children are children, not adults, I hear you say. Well, many similarly ridiculed the idea of taking women seriously because women are women, not men. It's a circular argument. And just as it now seems obvious that the differences once thought to exist between men and women either didn't exist or only existed because of the patriarchal culture of the time and certainly weren't any justification for not taking women seriously. One day, it'll be obvious 
to everyone that the differences currently thought to exist between adults and children either don't exist or wouldn't exist if we were taking children seriously and that they certainly don't justify not taking children seriously. Now you may be thinking, come on, children are dependent. Obviously we need to manage them for their own good. If so, do you apply that argument consistently? Do you think that everyone who's dependent doesn't have the right to be in control of their own affairs? Do you think that a home educating father with no income shouldn't have control over his life because he's dependent on his partner's income? Do you think that a soldier loses his right to self-determination if he becomes dependent after losing three of his limbs in war? Aren't we all dependent in some way? Why single out children? Let's look at this difference in view we have with respect to making mistakes. Everyone believes that adults should be free to make mistakes. We view their life as ultimately a matter for them. And of course, if we see someone making a mistake, we can point out the mistake, but if they're not persuaded, they get to do what they think best. We don't get to coercively protect them from their mistakes. Even if the entire world could see that someone is making the biggest mistake in her life, the biggest mistake in the world, we still take the view with, for adults that it's their life and they ultimately get to choose and they can make mistakes. But for children, we view it differently. Children, coercion is justified, we think. It's good for them. We need to coercively protect them. Why is it good for them, but not for us? If you say that coercion is justified because adults know more than children, do you apply that argument consistently? Do you say that those who know the most in the world would be, coerced, would be justified in coercing the rest of us? Do you think that's what should be happening? The standard way of viewing children is that they're not quite equal to us. They're not creative and rational like we are and they won't learn unless subjected to unwanted teaching. It's the family as benevolent dictatorship idea, or perhaps parent as the captain of the ship, if you prefer, in which we're responsible for steering the child ship to avoid icebergs on her journey to adulthood. And you may say, well, okay, it's true that some parents run a tight ship and throw them in the brig if there's any disobedience, give them a time out. But other parents are lenient. They give their children a lot more leeway. Either way, it's still all viewing children through the same paternalism. This view of children as being less than, not quite equal to us, creates an inherently authoritarian, hierarchical parent-child relationship that pits parents and children against each other. A top-down relationship in which the parents' ideas are given authority and the children aren't free. There's a reason for the rights and freedoms we have. There's a reason we're free to manage our own affairs. There's a reason for freedom of speech and so on. So as not to suppress the growth of knowledge. 
And in previous societies that didn't have those freedoms, the growth of knowledge was suppressed and life was miserable for everyone. The Enlightenment arose out of the idea that that shouldn't happen. Hierarchical top-down relationships impede the growth of knowledge. And that's true irrespective of sex or race. And it's also true irrespective of age too. So I propose that we drop the paternalism in favor of autonomy respecting side by side equal relationships in which the ideas can all compete freely and parents and children are on the same side. No one's ideas have authority. It's not obvious why people leap to the startling conclusion that children aren't noticing problems, creating at least as many explanatory conjectures as we do, criticizing them and learning just like we do. So to the extent that we ourselves are creative and rational, so are they. Now you may be thinking, what about babies? They just cry all the time. How is that rational? You know, I'm not seeing any evidence of babies being creative and rational. How do children ever become rational if they start out irrational? People make the mistake of judging babies by their lack of knowledge. They mistake lack of knowledge for a lack of rationality. And of course, when babies are born, their knowledge and their means of communication is limited. But contrary to what many people imagine, they do do more than crying. There are pre-crying utterances they make that are meaningful, that, for example, express a wish to be fed. If your baby says, ne, if it's a young baby, the baby is asking to be fed. And of course, because we're all oblivious, we don't pay any attention until our baby is screaming. Well, you know, if someone asks nicely, <laughs> makes a polite request, and it's just completely ignored. Well, I myself have been known to scream on occasion. Yet we declare babies irrational because of the way they express themselves. How to express ourselves through pleasant, rational sounding conversation is something we learn. It only seems obvious to us how to communicate through rational sounding conversation because we've created that knowledge. If babies weren't creative and rational, they'd be unable to learn to speak. Yet children learn language, whether anyone's teaching them or not. They're learning as many as 20 words a day. And that's just a tiny fraction of what they're learning. Even if we just look at what they're learning in terms of language, they're learning you know, the meanings of words, grammar, how we say things, which words and forms of words to use when, and when we shouldn't be using such words. They're learning nuances. They're learning the cultural significance of everything. That's all well and good, you may think, but how can we have this equal relationship with a two-year-old who knows so much less than we do? It's not about how much each party knows. It's about the view you have, the theory you have of the relationship and the other person. And it's about how you view knowledge and the mind. If you see the mind as being passive, like a bucket, and knowledge as being 
like a fluid that needs to be poured into the mind from above, you'll be viewing children as being as passively receiving the knowledge that you think you're pouring in from above. And the relationship will necessarily be hierarchical. And similarly, if you're a behaviorist, you'll be manipulating the black box mindless child object using classical or operant conditioning. That's treating the child's thinking as if it doesn't exist. And your thinking as being necessarily right. If we're fallibilists, of course, we're viewing others and the ideas of others as equals. The ideas from all the sources compete freely. No one's ideas have authority over anyone else's ideas. It's not about how much the different parties know. And it's also not about the overt form of the relationship. You can have an autonomy respecting equal relationship in the way I'm talking about with your boss or with your employees or with your child. It's the substance that matters. It's how you view the other person and interact with them, not the overt form. And for that matter, you can have a hierarchical, non-equal relationship with someone who's nominally a peer. It's the substance that matters, not the form. In equal autonomy respecting relationships informed by fallibilism, we're not viewing the other person as being beneath us or inferior to us. And we're viewing the life and choices of others as being a matter for them. And we're so confident that the other person doesn't need to be managed or controlled that it wouldn't even occur to us to mention that confidence. There's an author who brands parents like me who believe in not saying no, jellyfish parents, and she advocates what she calls backbone parents who provide consistency and firmness. And she suggests saying to children things like, I believe in you, I trust you. And she claims that saying those things is not coercive. I disagree. If you've ever been on the sharp end of this parenting strategy, you know that the carrot of I trust you is backed by the stick of don't disappoint me. What's the purpose of saying those things if they aren't in doubt? Doesn't I trust you usually mean I don't trust you as far as I could throw you. Show me I'm wrong. And sometimes when we say, I believe in you, either we're trying to prop up the child that we're seeing as beneath us, or we're really saying, I don't in any way believe you. Please try not to embarrass me by being the utter failure I'm expecting you to be. Praising and rewarding children is similarly coercive. They're an expression of superiority, evaluation from above, judgment of the child's performance, expecting the child to perform for you. The goal of praise is to manipulate using operant conditioning. Again, in effect, it denies the existence of the child as a person with a mind. Would you say good job to an adult you respect? No, you might say thank you, or you might express genuine respect or admiration, appreciation, but you wouldn't say good job. Notice if you read books aimed at parents that there are a lot of strange phrases that you wouldn't use when you're thinking about adults that are reserved for children. And of course, the good job carrot 
is backed by the stick of my potential negative evaluation of your performance. Praise embodies or suggests it's, it's a hierarchical, unequal, coercive relationship in a way that genuine expressions of gratitude or admiration even aren't. The standard view of children embodies the false theory that children don't have reasons like we do. The causes of their actions are outside their minds or they don't have minds but actually they do have reasons just like we do. And taking children seriously means engaging with their reasons, not discounting them. The standard paternalistic view of children is so ubiquitous that it even appears in books by authors who seem to really think that they are against coercion and manipulation. So let's look at some examples, and I will be slightly rewording some of them to highlight the anomaly, the difference in our view, and to show you how vile the standard view is. What would you think of this advice I'm going to read now? It's slightly reworded. Quote, what if my wife refuses, a husband asks. I respond that such a husband needs to understand that his wife isn't used to having a husband who holds to a limit. Such a wife is likely to require longer to comply with a limit willingly. The husband simply needs to hold his ground by not leaving the space until the screen is either turned off or handed over. To comply with a limit willingly? If that's willingly, I'd hate to see unwillingly. If that would be appalling treatment of an adult, why is it okay to treat children that way? Here's an example of an author failing to even consider that a child could have reasons for behaving in a way that adults deem challenging. Quote, some of the many causes of challenging behaviours are unmet need for human connection, unmet physical and or emotional needs, stress caused by a child's emotional development, environmental conditions that compromise a child's physical well-being, physical and or emotional sensitivities with which a child is born, sensitivities that are part of a child's innate temperament, physical and or emotional sensitivities or challenges caused by stresses during and following birth, sensory processing challenges. Well, where is, you know, there's a disagreement and you're not listening. Somehow that doesn't make it to the list. What would you think of this advice? And again, I'm slightly rewording this quote. With husbands who are especially oppositional and with almost all young men, it works much better to make a request if they've already said yes. In other words, you want a man to be already nodding, literally or figuratively, to ensure a greater chance that he'll feel more naturally inclined to do what you ask. I generally ask wives to try to get the husband to nod or say yes three times before telling him to do something. This helps him feel connected and heard and also predisposes him to do what you ask. Would you like to be patronised and manipulated like that? What if your husband forbade you from doing something and said this, quote, slightly reworded, Sweetie, I don't know whether I'm right, but as a husband, it's my job to make this decision. Some things are judgment calls. Do you agree that there are some things husbands need to make the decision about? So long as the wife feels really listened to and understands it's a tough question for a husband and I'm doing my best as a husband to keep my wife safe, even if she doesn't like it, we will usually end up okay. We can't always reach agreement, but 
Wives need to feel listened to and taken seriously. Would that be taking you seriously? Would that be taking your ideas seriously? Would that be an equal relationship or would that be his ideas, him having authority? Is taking someone seriously just a matter of making them feel heard? Is taking someone seriously consistent with managing and manipulating them? I don't think so. Here's another quote. I'm not so concerned with whether they make all the same choices or use the same strategies that I do, but with whether their actions and words and tone of voice make it clear, clear that they take their kids seriously. In that quote, it's all about our choices, our parenting strategies, what we think best. The child's wishes, reasons, thinking seem to be barely looked at, not even considered, as though the child doesn't even exist as a sovereign person with agency like we are. Is it okay to coerce people as long as we help them process the emotions caused by our coercion? Quote, our adult ability to tolerate frustration takes root in our childhood. More precisely, it involves our parents' ability to teach us how to handle the word no and cope with our residual emotion. Some parents say the word no but don't help their children process the emotions around this. If your boyfriend said no for your own good, but offered to help you process the emotions around that, would that be an equal relationship in which everyone's ideas are being taken seriously, competing freely? Or would that be a hierarchical relationship? Here's another quotation about how to view and deal with what this author calls big emotions resulting from your coercion. Uh, some people may want to close their ears for this one. Welcome the upset. The more he cries, the better. The fear is locked in his body. He may thrash and sweat and want to push against something. That all helps his body to let go of the fear. If he lashes out, move back so he can't hurt you. Your job is to help him feel safe enough to get past the anger to the more vulnerable fear, grief and powerlessness beneath. What if it were a husband feeling entitled to coerce his wife? What if he offered to help his wife get past the anger to the fear, grief, and powerlessness beneath. Would that make it okay that he's coercing her? Another thing we find in books for parents, viewing children through this lens of paternalism, through these hierarchical coercive relationships, is lots of stuff about what the research says, what the studies say, allegedly, what's effective, instead of how's it right or wrong to treat someone. Quote, over and over, research has demonstrated how detrimental manipulation and coercion are to a child's sense of self and well-being. Well, if the research said the opposite, and I'm sure, by the way, that you could find research saying the opposite because people have their agendas when they're doing this research and they can make it say anything. But if it did say the opposite, would that make it okay to manipulate and coerce people? I mean, sorry, sorry, children, children. We have this different view we just have a completely different standard when it comes to children. We look at what's effective, 
what the research allegedly says. Quote, some adults insist that a good wallop never did them any harm, but the actual results, the actual research suggests the opposite. Well, again, does what the research says make immoral behavior moral? And by the way, why do we call it a good wallop or corporal punishment when we hit a child, but domestic violence when we hit our wife or assault or battery when we hit an employee? We have a different view of children. It's all about what's effective. Quote, no specific intervention, neither mine nor anyone else's, is guaranteed to be effective. What I'll be suggesting, describing, has a much better chance of success. It's all about what works, what strategies are effective to produce the desired product. As though children are lumps of clay awaiting our mouldings, pragmatism, paternalism is not taking children seriously. And it's not letting the ideas compete freely. Quote, the key is to see what works best and then to manage the process to get the best results from your child. It's all the child as product, the child as below us. We are crafting this child object. There's a lot of deceptive language in books aimed at parents. I mean, so much it's staggering. Um, here's an example of that, and it's also paternalism again. Quote, Maria Montessori, the groundbreaking educator, realized that when adults facilitate the proper environment, we can tap into children's intrinsic desire to learn and be independent. And children are given some power. They're allowed to choose their work from a prescribed range of options. That's not taking children seriously. If you were allowed to choose from a prescribed range of options, would that constitute giving you some power or reducing your power? How would you feel if your wife left a note on your dinner plate saying, you can have your dinner after you've done the chores and you can do your chores anytime you like. And the authors who say this are saying that that's a free choice for the child. The slave overseers of old likewise found it very effective to threaten to deny food, but at least they didn't pretend to be increasing slaves' freedom of action. This paternalistic view of children is all about what we think best and calling it the child's free choice. And what the child thinks and wants just aren't even part of the picture. It's not taking them seriously. Here's another example. Quote, when she's older, Talk to your child about how you feel about screen time. You can use win-win problem solving to set healthy limits together. No one who uses language decently would call that win-win problem solving. There's nothing together about that limit setting. There's so much of this kind of Orwellian language in books aimed at parents so-called requests that the child isn't allowed to refuse, so-called agreements that the child absolutely doesn't agree to, so-called natural consequences that are anything but natural. It's all about how to get the children to obey and using non-coercive sounding words to hide the coercive reality behind a semblance of empathy. What would you think of this advice? A slightly reworded quote. 
If we establish a boundary that allows for no more than 30 minutes of screen time before it's time for our wife to iron our shirts and our wife violates this, it's important to hold the limit consistently while at the same time showing empathy. There are a variety of ways to go about doing this. We can come to an agreement with our wife so that if she breaks the agreement, she knows the screens will be removed from the equation until the ironing has been completed. If our wife pitches a fit, the husband stays resolute in his request that the screen be shut down or handed over. Holding firm on boundaries and limits doesn't mean we use coercion or harshness, which can easily border on abuse. Instead, we help our wife engage the issue with a sense of joy and lightness. Would that be good advice for husbands? Why is it okay to double bind a child that way, but not an adult? It was actually advice to parents about how to get the child to do homework. And notice that not only is the author advocating that the child be coerced to do the homework, and not only is she advocating that the parent coercively impose these 30 minute screen time limits, but she also requires the child to have agreed, to pretend to have agreed to the coercive limits and rules and to obey with a sense of joy and lightness. Talk about a double bind. It's brutal under the Zen veneer. Forget about what children want. Forget about what children think. Instead, we're told by expert after expert that the proper question to ask is, what do children need? How about this? marital advice to ignore your wife's wishes in favour of what you think she needs. Quote, slightly reworded. Husbands often confuse meeting their wife's needs with making her happy. Meeting your wife's needs does not always make her happy. Women need to strict, stick to a strict diet to remain slim and healthy. Being told that it's time to stop eating may not make them happy. Telling your wife that she can eat that piece of cake would make her happy, but it wouldn't meet her real need to have a husband who will support her in being slim and healthy. Meeting women's needs sometimes means loving them enough to say no and set limits. What does it mean to be a real need that the person herself doesn't want? And by the way, we're told that focusing on these alleged needs is taking children seriously. Quote, to focus on children's needs and to work with them to make sure their needs are met constitutes a commitment to taking children seriously. A child's preferences can't always be accommodated, but they can be considered and they never need be dismissed out of hand. And what do these experts say the children need? Why, teaching, of course, whether they like it or not. When a child does something inappropriate, I'm quoting here, it's an opportunity for teaching. Moreover, to see children's behavior as a teachable moment invites us to include them in the process of solving the problem, which is more likely to be effective. There's that word effective again. Would it be taking you seriously if your husband or wife were thinking in terms of teachable moments for you? Or would that be patronizing hierarchical coercive relationship territory? How about this example? And again, I'm rewording the quote. If our wife is having problems with a certain issue, such as being loud when we are on the telephone, that becomes our signal for what she needs to learn. How would you feel if your husband was committed to ensuring that you learned what he thinks you need to learn and didn't listen when you indicated that you weren't interested? 
would that be taking you seriously? Like this, and again, I'm rewording the quote. When my wife doesn't show respect, it is a signal to me that we have more teaching to do. In this case, I want to ask myself a few questions. Does she understand what I expect about showing respect? Erin, is that showing respect? I don't know. You've told me before that you don't feel respected if somebody yells at you. What about if someone talks back to you? I don't know. Would you like it if I talked back to you? I don't care. Really? So you mean it's okay if I start talking back to you? If that's what turns you on. And by this time, I'm losing the will to live. There was a lot more and I'll just conclude with the slight misquote. Here, I'm educating her a little more about some of the finer points of respect. Books for parents tend to be full of suggested questions embodying a pedagogical paternalistic agenda about ask that you should ask children things to teach them things. But asking questions we know the answer to is testing them, it's evaluating them, it's judging them from above. Such suggested questions are all about channeling the child into our pedagogical agenda. Obviously, we're thinking it's for their own good. Nevertheless, it's not taking them seriously. We're steering them, molding and shaping them. Their own ideas aren't relevant, can't be allowed to compete freely. We shouldn't be giving what Karl Popper called unwanted answers to unasked questions, let alone unwanted questions to check their answers. As I know from my own life, unsolicited advice can sometimes be unwanted answers to unasked questions and thus problematic. If we're Popperians, we may view it as theory sharing or helpful criticism and wonder why it sometimes seems unwelcome. Our intention is to be helpful, but advice giving can be boundary violating and it can come from this place of looking down on and not having the boundless confidence in your child that you'd have in your friends or your spouse. If there's a pattern of your theory sharing being unwelcome, you may have a blind spot like I did. And on the other hand, sometimes we fail to share our theories again, because we're viewing the child through the lens of paternalism or at least not quite viewing the child as equal to us. We're viewing the child as this delicate flower. That's problematic too. For example, suppose I were going for a job interview and I was unaware that that particular firm had a very strict dress code, of a smart professional dress code of wear a black suit, basically, conservative black suit. And I was dressed, I was about to leave home and I was dressed inappropriately for that firm. I would really hope that my loved ones would let me know <laughs> that I was dressed inappropriately, share their theory that I might want to change because I wouldn't want to lose the job just because I'm wearing the wrong outfit. So that's an example of where not sharing your theory would be a mistake. And obviously, we do need to offer our children all sorts of information about dangers, for example. And people find when they're taking their children seriously that they are trusted advisors to their children. We need to offer our children lots of ideas and criticism, access to them, that is, and things that they might want to know about. Taking children seriously doesn't mean 
not sharing your theories. But it does mean being sensitive to whether the other person wants to hear your theory. If there's a pattern of us being worried about our child, that's a lack of confidence in the child too. Again, we may be seeing the child as beneath us. Don't imagine that our children don't sense our worry and find it intrusive, coercive. Whenever problems have become a bit of a pattern, that is a clue that something is off, that there may still be a touch of paternalism in our view. Problems really are soluble. What is blocking the solving of this particular one that's become a pattern? The kind of thing that can happen, and it can happen to all of us, we're all fallible human beings, and we don't necessarily have the knowledge, and we can't always create it right then when we need it. We all make mistakes. But the kind of things that can happen are, if we inadvertently have a fixed idea of what a solution would look like. And so instead of thinking laterally and creatively and questioning everything and jointly solving the problem, we have this unexamined theory of what must happen. And maybe we're thinking in terms of how to get the child to feel okay about our solution. It's just not quite right. It's not quite a real solution. And really that's not usually <laughs> how we'd approach problem solving in an equal relationship, is it? It's not quite allowing the ideas to compete freely. It's still thinking we know best. Unequal hierarchical relationships and paternalism can creep in even when we very much want to be taking our children seriously. As in my case, blind spots. I continue to discover blind spots I've had with respect to taking children seriously often. Truth is not manifest. We don't know in a way that's infallible how to take children seriously it's we have theories about it and we can be mistaken and many of our ideas are un, are very likely to be mistaken we are fallible but one thing i have found helpful is looking at this from the perspective of the difference in view am i inadvertently looking down on my child from above, hierarchical relationship style, viewing my child as being not quite equal, not quite a fully autonomous person. Do I have an agenda for them? Am I inadvertently or intentionally steering them for their own good, of course, but still? So taking children seriously means replacing these hierarchical, paternalistic, we know best relationships with non-coercive, autonomy respecting, side-by-side -side relationships in which all the ideas can compete freely irrespective of source. Taking children seriously means taking ideas seriously, not impeding the growth of knowledge. And for the Popperians in the audience, taking ideas and the growth of knowledge seriously means taking children seriously too. Just as it's obvious to us now that women and black people should be taken seriously, I do predict that one day it will be obvious to everyone that children should be taken seriously too. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit long. <laughs> great. No, that was great. Thank you so much for the talk. I thought that was a really interesting elaboration of, of the ways in which we view children differently and how yeah, we might not always be right about that. 
um, I'll, if it's all right, I'll jump in with the first question. Um, near the well, actually, a small question first. The the quote about teachable moments. Am I right that that was Alfie Cohn? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there were several quotes from him actually. Oh right. Okay. You mentioned near the beginning of the talk um, the idea that children are dependent and therefore we shouldn't allow them to make their own decisions. Um, and well, you compared that to... Well, I mentioned that people think that. Right, right. Um, and you compared that to um, saying a veteran shouldn't be allowed to make his own decisions because he, he doesn't have limbs and so he's dependent uh, on carers. Um, and so just to play devil's advocate, isn't... Wouldn't you say... Well, wouldn't most people say that... Um, the a veteran um, is so a veteran has a bank account and has property and has a past history of uh, working in the army as an independent adult. So he can have responsibilities that, or he or she can have responsibilities that a child cannot have. Um, whereas children, so they begin as newborns and they literally can't make any decisions. Um, and there is a gradual process of children having more and more responsibility and with that more and more freedom. So what would you say to that view? Well, actually, um, I would say that it's not actually true that babies can't make decisions. They do have theories from birth. They are, they, as I said, that someone... Uh, Patricia, no, not Patricia, Priscilla Dunstan has translated some of young babies' pre-crying utterances, and they are meaningful. And when she teaches parents these utterances, like if the baby says, ne, it means I want to be fed. I mean, I suppose you could say, well, that's not a theory because it's not conscious, but that's ridiculous. We can have theories unconsciously and inexplicitly as well as consciously. So for a start, it's not true that babies don't have theories and say that they want something. Um, but I, th I think that really, if you're saying that it's because babies are dependent that they shouldn't be taken seriously, I, what is the argument that for for not saying the same for other kinds of dependence, I I just don't see how that argument works. It it doesn't doesn't seem to work to me. Um, they they're still creative and rational. And when you're, I mean, I suppose you you could say that if you're saying well, people who are dependent shouldn't their ideas. If it's, a, if it's a baby, shouldn't be allowed to compete freely and that some ideas should be authoritative, but uh, that doesn't apply for adults. Well, how is that not just making it up as you go along, just making an arbitrary distinction? As I, as I said, uh, if you don't believe that children are creative and rational, then how do you explain the fact that they learn language? The fact that they learn language and all the other stuff that they learn is, is shows that they are creative and rational. And if they are, then as we know, if we're fallibilists, we're all fall fallible. There's no one who's more fallible or less fallible. And so all the ideas should be competing freely. None of those arguments for giving some ideas authority work. Okay, I, I might come back with a follow up question, but I see cool. Luli, um, Luli has a question in the chat. Um, or is that? Yes. Is it? I, I can Sorry. ask it if that's easier. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I was, I was yeah. just asking, um, it's just kind of like a side remark. I, I don't think it, it affects your, your main point, but um, regarding the language that, uh, that babies have, um, so if, if that's inborn, then wouldn't that be not the same kind of theory as like adult theories, because it's, it's more like a, a bit of code or sort of. Yes. A... yes. However, 
when babies' pre-crying utterances are listened to and their wishes are met promptly, instead of losing those things like ne, which has some kind of, um, it's, a, it's a reflex to do with sucking, they continue to say ne when they want to be fed after the point where babies whose pre-crying utterances are not listened to and acted on. So whether it's inexplicit or, I mean, obviously it's inexplicit, they don't have language, but clearly they are saying ne because they want to be fed and they continue after the reflex normally is gone. And actually there's been a vast amount of research, very ingenious experiments or studies or whatever, looking at babies and it's incredible actually, some of the things that I would never have guessed that babies can do, like they, they've shown that babies have empathy, they've shown that babies are forming theories, making conjectures, and then they're surprised when their conjecture is refuted. There are all kinds of interesting experiments or studies looking at babies and their theories and what, they, what they're learning. It's, it's just not true that babies aren't rational. And again, if they aren't rational, then when is this rationality switched on? They're learning, they're learning all the time from birth. Great. Um, just to everyone else, um, if you have, if you do have a question, you can click. There's a button that you can click to raise your hand. I see Diana um, has raised her hand. Do you want to ask your question, Diana? Hi, Sarah. I just wanted to say that I absolutely loved your talk. I was just on fire listening to it. It was brilliant. And um, I've never heard of Karl Popper before. I just uh, randomly clicked on this event on Facebook because it interested me, but I'm just feeling so grateful that I got to hear you today. And I have like a zillion questions, but I'll just stick to one for now. Do you think there's a connection between the way that people see animals and the way that people see children? Yes, I do. I think that, well, actually, I think, unfortunately, it's worse for children in that most parts of the animal training world have realized quite some time ago now that punishment, coercion, you know, beating the dog doesn't work like it's it doesn't it actually what it does is to make the dog scared and then they're not learning or I mean it's not I don't think it's learning but they're not learning to do this trick or whatever whereas operant conditioning the animal training world thinks does work to train animals to do various things and not do various things Whereas with children, we're, we're still at the, you know, we're still at the punishment and coercion <laughs> end of the theories about what to do with children, how to view children. So, yeah, I think that praising and rewarding and punishing and negatively reinforcing, all that is behaviorist conditioning and animal trainers prefer the what they think of as the more positive or you know the less uh, brutal operant conditioning over the classical conditioning but children have minds you know, we're, we're not animals you know um there's a there's a, a plant a flower that can be operantly conditioned i think it's called the mimosa pudica well, that doesn't have a, a brain of any kind. 
So this view of children where we're trying to steer them and manipulate them and coerce them and praise them into channeling them into our vision of what they should be and what they should do and not do. It's basically saying you're more like an animal or a mimosa pudica than a person. Can I ask a follow-up to that? So you know how, do you mind Liberty? No, not at all, go ahead. You know how um, a lot of times, at least in America or uh, in like the United States where I live, people will talk about their dogs or cats like they're members of the family, um, just like their babies are members of the family. Um, I work in farm animal advocacy or just animal advocacy in general. And um, I wonder about the connection between eating animals. Like we love animals and we eat them. We love our children and we control them. I sort of, I wonder if, since farm animal advocacy right now is something that has some traction, right? Like, especially in the UK more so than the US um, and other parts of the world. Anyway, it's a, it's a long story. But um, because that already has some traction, I wonder if that could be a good portal for getting more people um, acclimated to these really important ideas. Because I guess the other thing I'm wondering is if you have any thoughts about how these ideas can be um, I, I heard, you know, the word effectiveness, pragmatism, maybe mentioned by you, if not like the most glowing of terms, but I, I understand that's because the language has really been twisted up by these awful guidebooks. But um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about how these ideas could be effectively disseminated, because I think what you're proposing would result in a very um, major change in the way that humans relate to one another. And it's like, you know, obviously something that will take time and will take like a lot of upheaval. So I'm curious about what you, if you have thoughts about the progression of that. Well, I hope my book will help. I haven't finished it yet, but um, I do hope that my book will help. <laughs> okay, there is a question from Ari. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Sure. <coughs> So to be honest, this isn't a question. This is really a testimonial because, um, you know, that was a beautiful speech, but also it's, you know, it was about the general concept. I just wanted to say that somebody who's been parenting following Sarah's advice or her written word for, you know, I have a 12 year old now, it's been, but since she's been one basically, <clears throat> um, it's so much more fun, so much more enjoyable the parent this way. Uh, it's a constant process of discovery. My kid teaches me so much. Um, I have the opportunity to have someone else's, her opinion turn out to be a real, something that I want to adopt. Um, there's a two-way exchange. In some areas I know more, but in other areas, to be specific, let's say nature, animation. Um, <clears throat> this idea of what to do on a Saturday afternoon. She's clearly superior. So I'm gonna wrap up this little testimonial now, but um, I wanted to get that in there for someone who's actually uh, using this approach. Thanks. <laughs> Very nice. Um, Sam, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, yeah, so first of all, thanks so much for the talk. I really enjoyed it and uh, I, I have a devil's advocate question because I'm basically on board with everything you said. But usually when I have conversations with people about this topic, the, one of the first things that pops up is, well, what are you going to, you know, we should respect children, but what are you going to do if uh, all that they want to do is drink soda and watch television? Shouldn't you, like, aren't you failing the child? if they turn out to like not want, want to exercise and they become overweight. Um, so that's, yeah, uh, you, you kind of addressed this in the talk, but I thought I would ask it explicitly. Well, of course, there could be a phenomenon 
of a child who is whose parent is inadvertently perhaps not giving them the resources to discover things that would interest them that would that might mean that they wouldn't be just watching television all the time say so i'm not saying that that couldn't happen that could happen in which case the answer is not coercion the answer is to have another look at you know what you're offering the child and see whether the child might be interested in something else now by the way uh, television is incredibly educational I and mean, if you think about it if an alien were to come to earth from outer space not knowing about our culture what would be the quickest way to learn about our culture well i suggest that it would be not reading textbooks or someone sitting them down teaching them it would be watching soap operas on television they would learn vastly more from that because you've got the inexplicit knowledge that's being conveyed through that particular medium so i disagree that there's a problem with children watching television or playing video games or any of the other things parents get really worried about but I'm not saying that if your child is living in a very poor environment, they might not, say, watch television or play video games because there's nothing else to do. Does that answer your question? Oh, the yes. healthy thing, the exercise healthy. Well, again, I think we each choose whether we want to exercise or not obviously you you might mention to your child that uh, lack of exercise is associated with this that and the other you know people think that if you exercise it's it's really makes you feel good and so on and so forth and it's healthy and it's good for your heart and so on but maybe the child is interested in something else at the moment so passionately that there just isn't time for exercise they don't want to turn their attention to that well how would it be if you said that if you were having this conversation with an adult obviously they get to make their own mistakes and children should be able to make their own mistakes too i'm not saying don't don't tell them your theories of course do realize that many of our theories that we're telling our children are probably going to turn out to be false we have to we have to bear in mind that we are fallible and not present our theories as though they are manifest truth yes yeah i think that makes sense and yeah thanks for the answer okay question from dennis yeah hi I uh, very much enjoyed your talk. I'm glad I got to be here for it. Um, <clears throat> you were saying earlier about how babies from a very young age use language to communicate that they're hungry, for example. I was wondering if you've given any thought to, like at what point in the development of a baby does creativity kick in? Like, is it entirely inborn? And like, does it happen after they're born? Does it happen in the womb still? Like, what do you think? Well, I don't know, but it certainly seems to me that babies are creative and rational from pretty much from birth. I mean, to me, it seems obvious that it was from birth, uh, but you know, I, I don't, I, you know, because babies are born only with inborn knowledge, obviously if they're, if they're not rational, then how do they ever criticize that inborn knowledge? How do they ever come up with theories that aren't inborn knowledge? So I, I do think it is from birth, actually. I mean, the fact that if their ne is met with being fed, 
then they continue to say ne even after the reflex ends. Well, I suppose that's not that's not really evidence because it could be operant conditioning, but it doesn't it doesn't seem to be operant conditioning in that Priscilla Dunstan has translated these pre-crying utterances, and when parents are aware of them, then they discover that their babies that have been screaming, you know, 24 hours a day are no longer doing so. So I think we should be paying attention and assuming that our newborn babies are creative and rational. Because if you're assuming that they're not and that it's going to be turned on at some later stage, then you won't be paying attention to those pre-crying utterances and other ways that they express wishes. And when you're not paying attention to them, then think about it logically. What that's teaching the baby is that their wishes are not going to be listened to. It's going to make them just give up. So I say, assume it's from birth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. I, I too think that that babies are creative. I've even wondered if maybe they start conjecturing things in the womb. Um, I think it's interesting to think about what they might be thinking about in the womb. Who knows? Interesting. Ari, um, assuming your story isn't uh, unreasonably long, then could you? No, I can keep it under 60 seconds or 90 Perfect. seconds. Yeah. So my kid loves watching YouTube. Last year, she sometimes says, I feel hollow after watching YouTube. So I'm not telling, I don't tell her to watch more YouTube or not. The point is she is developing her own inquiry into what it means for her to watch YouTube and the quantity that is right for her on any given day or moment. She's developing her own um, questions and examination of this. And she may not figure out for a few more years, but by letting her inquire this way, she is actually getting a deep internal understanding of what this means to watch the right amount of TV purely for her. And if I interfered and tried to put anything on it, I would be inhibiting her discovery of the knowledge of the right amount of YouTube for her. I'm sure that it's just uh, the form of words that you use, but when people say letting, as in letting the child do something, to me, that's slightly uh you know that's slightly this hierarchical view of the child and i i would i would uh suggest that maybe thinking about whether whether she has enough options you know whether whether you're giving her enough access to other things um I'm only using the word letting in contrast to the okay. conventional approach here. <laughs> that doesn't represent my own internal view of what I'm doing. Okay. Um, yeah, I would. I it's um, the idea. I don't really understand why someone would continue watching something that is making them feel hollow. It's so, because when she she doesn't. <clears throat> She doesn't notice when the moment of being full to not mm -hmm. being to being over full is, and it glides past in ha habit. I mm -hmm. think that's what's going on. Just like someone can not mm -hmm. notice when to stop eating in their own case, and they notice after they're already over full that they're full. That's my sense mm -hmm. of what's going on, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, maybe she's still discovering how it feels to be interested in something or not interested in something. Exactly. And that's a great thing to discover, discovering what we want and working out how to tell if this is something we want or we're actually not interested is that's incredibly important. And that's one thing that the standard view of children tends to muck up. Taha has written a question in the chat, which I'll just read. Would keeping chemicals, sharps, etc., out of reach of children from two to four years qualify as authoritative 
um, and how to balance taking children seriously with keeping them safe? It's not a balance. We obviously need to keep our children safe and I wouldn't recommend leaving, you know, needles and um, bleach on the, and broken glass on the kitchen floor. Uh, that, that doesn't mean that you're not taking children seriously. I would, by the way, as soon as you can, start showing your young children, your very, very young children, dangers so that they are protected by their knowledge rather than by coercion or just not even knowing that the things exist. But no, it's not a balance. You can take your children seriously and not leave broken glass on the floor. That's Great, okay. Um, anyone else who has a question, please do raise your hand. It's in the reactions, it says a button which says reactions and that's where the raise hand function is. Um, we've got about five minutes left. Um, if I could go back to my question and follow up, um, I think I think most people, so um, forget the question of um, whether babies are rational or whether they're creative. Um, so there's a view that, um, so babies cannot have certain responsibilities, like they can't own property and they can't have a, a job. Um, so, so the view is that as you become able to take certain responsibilities, you also gain certain freedoms. Um, so I'm not sure if that makes the question clearer, um, but yeah, do you have anything else to say about that? It's, I, I don't think that it should be, there should be a question of children not having freedoms. I think they should have freedoms. And the fact that they're not taken seriously now and that there are all these things in our culture that are depriving children of freedom doesn't mean that that's how it will be in the future. Um, and as, by the way, with respect to the knives and thing, the knives and broken glass or whatever, as, as Luli said, uh, it does depend on whether the child wants you to leave those things lying about. I was thinking in terms of a baby, but I see the question was about two to four year olds and they might well have a view. Um, okay, yeah. Um, Diana, another question? Uh, it's just a sort of to ping off what you said, Liberty, but I feel like your question works under the assumption that of a, of a, like a capitalist society where we have to have jobs and earn money. Like if a baby's job is to be a lot, if our jobs are just to live and live wholeheartedly and mindfully and stuff, that might not be a society that has jobs that pay people money and like we need babies to be thinking about their earning potential right out the womb, if that makes sense. Um, so I don't know if that resonates with anyone, but that's just what came to mind for me. By the way, when I was a child, it was quite common for children to do various jobs. Um, I know that that's not the case now, but certainly lots of lots of my classmates had part-time jobs when I was a, a child at school. So I I think you know things things will change. I think that the obviously the law against children working was well-meaning, but it's. I think that in the future, when we're all taking children seriously and not viewing them through this lens of paternalism, that will probably change. Hmm. Um, I see there is a question from uh, Barish. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, go um, ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if this asked before, but I couldn't, uh, I missed some part of it. 
Uh, I argued this question with a friend of mine who is a doctor. And I asked him the theory is the first or the, uh, sorry for my English, <laughs> the theory comes b before or the observation comes before. And he said, the babies are just a fuzzy view, has a fuzzy view of the world. I mean, look at their eyes and they don't see like six months Earth exactly. And this kind of make, it's, it's kind of make me fuzzy to think about the theory or the observation comes first. Well, as Popper says, observation is inherently theory laden. And yeah, I know there's stuff about babies' eyesight changing from when they're first born. And that's presumably why we all hold our baby close and look into her eyes rather than talking to her from across the room. Well, of course, some people do that, but um, uh, I, th I think that Popper has made the case and David Deutsch that observation is theory laden, observation does not come first. You know, when, when Popper told his students to observe, they were saying, observe what? There's, a, there's always a theory. Obviously, with a, with a newborn baby, it's not going to be an explicit theory because they don't have language yet, but their mind is making conjectures inexplicitly. So I was just wondering what they might think of the, about the world. Well, they're not thinking explicitly before they have language. But I think their minds are rational and creative and they are initially creating knowledge inexplicitly and then gradually they learn language. Thank you. We will take one final question um, from Dennis. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. No, please take Christine then, because I've already spoken. Uh, go ahead, Christine. Thanks. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I came from China. Uh, you know, so Sarah and Sarah talk about this question. I think it's a, I mean, uh, China is like, a, I mean, that's the most problem, I mean, uh, in China about this. But in, I mean, uh, but from Sarah's point of view, I mean, it's a little bit, uh, from my point of view, baby, uh, even if they have theory, but uh, I, I mean, they are prototype. I mean, it's like, a, very raw uh, kind of kind of I mean you need to have a better theory to <laughs> to explain things right I mean they they uh, I, I I don't I mean we should respect children but uh, children we don't we're not quite I mean equal not quite equal uh, that's my, my point. I mean, take children seriously means uh, respect and the look into the eye, like with the equal, uh, we, are, we are equal. I respect you. I'm listening to you. That's it. Uh, I don't want to assume that, that children like uh, that. <laughs> I, I just, I, I mean, I think children are prototype. Like as we are software, Software is like in a raw, it's a prototype. And then you need to further like uh, adapt to your environment. I mean, it's, uh, 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 <laughs> that's my, my, my view. Thank you. When I, when I said, uh, when I talked about equal relationships, I didn't mean that we all know the same. I didn't mean equal in that sense. I meant equal in the sense that we're all equally fallible yes and so giving authority to one source's ideas like the parents is irrational it's irrational exactly. so children yes know less than we do but they're still creative and rational exactly. and 
if we are steering them, then even if we call it respecting them, it's still not taking them seriously. We can offer them ideas, we can offer them information about dangers, say, information about things that they might become interested in, given what they're interested in, but ultimately they should be in control of their own lives, just like we are. Okay, um, that's all we have time for. Thank you all so much for joining and for engaging uh, with Sarah's arguments. Um, feel free to join us on Clubhouse now. Sam has posted a link to the Clubhouse room in the chat. Um, and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.